All right, good morning. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Peter Schlegel, who has lots of titles, and it's worth it to go through them. He's the Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs, the James J. Cole Colt, Professor and Chairman of the Department of Urology at Wild Cornell Medical College just down the road, and Urologist-in-Chief at New York Presbyterian Hospital. He's a graduate of the University of Massachusetts Medical School, and he developed his academic urologic career during his medical residency with the definition of the neurovascular anatomy of the pelvis, research performed under Dr. Patrick Walsh at Johns Hopkins, one of the most known urologists in the world, dare I say. Uh, this anatomical work helped to form the basis for the procedure of the nerve-sparing radical retropubic prostatectomy for prostate cancer. After completion of his residency at Hopkins, he developed a special interest in endocrine action and male reproductive function and was a fellow at the Population Council at, um, at the Rockefeller University. He joined the faculty of Wild Cornell in 1991 and he has developed novel hormonal therapies for men with impaired testosterone production, was the PI on US and international trials for GnRH agonists for prostate cancer, and has developed protocols for genetic testing of infertile men, as well as to define the prognostic role of these tests in male infertility treatment. He also developed, performed, and published on novel techniques for sperm retrieval for azospermic men. His technique for sperm retrieval in men with non-obstructive azospermia is referred to as microdissection, T-E-S-E. -E. I don't know how you use it, micro T's? Tessie. Tessie, okay. And it's been adopted in many centers around the world as an optimal approach for treatment. So I know him from all of the above because I worked on some similar fields and because he's just really well published and really well known and has done fantastic work. I was most personally impacted by some of his work on Kleinfelters that I think he's gonna talk about today. So for many years, I've been the director of the endocrine medical student second year pathophysiology course. And for even more years than that, I've given the male reproductive lecture. And for the first, 50% of those years, there was dogma. And the dogma was that men with plank filters were 100% azospermic and 100% infertile. And that's what I said year after year after year until you spoke at the Endocrine Society, I believe. And then I thought, uh-oh, I think I have to change my slide and change my tune. And, uh, and so I did. And the greatest lesson I got from that, both as a physician and a medical educator, is that facts actually change. So what you have to teach medical students is a way of thinking and to be open and to be curious and to always be challenging the dogma even while you're practicing the classics. So I thank you for that. I'm really looking forward to your talk. So I apologize in advance that my voice is not perfect today, and hopefully we won't have too many coughing fits. Um, but I wanted to take you a little bit sort of through the, the pathways that we have taken. As Alice said, we figured out a number of things in male infertility. Um, I'm actually the male infertility guideline chair, and you know the AUA and ASRM put together this huge literature search on male infertility, and I'm actually dismayed at the limited number of what I would consider high-level data or high-level evidence in terms of treatment of male infertility that actually exists. Um, that will probably come out later this year, and again, some of those details are still being worked on. So I trained in a place where most people did prostate cancer surgery. Prostate cancer surgery was evolving at that point, but fortunately, my uh, chair at that point really got his start in urology by working with Gene Wilson, and so he got his background truly in hormonal action. Through hormonal action, he became interested in BPH, became interested in prostate cancer, and as a surgeon, 
uh, and actually quite a good surgeon, he further refined some of those techniques, and it was great to be able to learn from him and work with him. So Herb Lepore was also one of my um, co-residents. Herb is now the chair at NYU. Herb and I used to talk a lot about you know, what you would do with your career and how you would use your research to sort of drive that forward. So Herb and I both looked at the field of prostate cancer surgery and said, you know, we'll never be recognized as prostate cancer surgeons. What else can we do? Herb took that to do work in medical therapy for BPH, which really didn't exist at that point, mostly through alpha blockers and then through 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Um, and I started looking at some other areas, including male infertility. So one thing that happened when I was late in my residency is I started to recognize that in the in vitro fertilization laboratory, they were doing far more in terms of bringing sperm and eggs together. And although some people would say, well, that could remove your ability to treat men, you could just bypass male infertility, I actually looked at it the other way. I looked at it that one, we're gonna be able to observe some interactions and some basic components of sperm function that we've never been able to observe before and quite possibly will open up the patients that we could treat. So for example, when I was a resident, man came in with congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. A, we didn't know why it occurred, and B, we had no treatment beyond donors. <coughs> so by the time I got into my fellowship, we were actively treating those patients by taking sperm typically out of the epididymis and using them with what's now a relatively crude in vitro fertilization technique. And by the time I finished my fellowship, we were ready to use that with ICSI or the single sperm ejection technique. So we opened up the opportunity to understand these patients much better because we were seeing hundreds and thousands of patients with congenital absence of the vas. And then we started asking the question, what about those men who are azospermic because of severe testicular dysfunction? Could we possibly treat them as well? And that sort of journey is going to be the, I wasn't just wandering around with that story. We're going somewhere. <laughs> That's really the background for how and why we started treating these men with severe male infertility. So let's go over some of the details of sort of how that's moved forward. Standard disclosure, I'm going to talk about off-label use for a whole bunch of drugs. Testolactone's really not available anymore, um, but certainly an astrazole, clomiphene, and HCG are. I'm not currently a consultant um, for any of the pharmaceuticals that may be related to this talk, but in the past, I've done work for AbbVie, Lilly, mostly on um, testosterone replacement therapy and the litigation and also to the FDA for some of their um, panels on testosterone therapy. So standard numbers used to be one in 500, probably closer to one in 600, one in 700 live births um, are young men with Klinefelter syndrome. Classically, that's 47XXY, but certainly a wide variety of mosaics uh, may be possible. When I talk about fine filters here, I'm going to talk almost exclusively about non-mosaic fine filters, or at least by area type, non-mosaic uh, fine filters. A, because some of the mosaics have sperm in the ejaculate, so we don't always see them, or we don't often see them as infertility patients. Um, and B, we're looking for a model of patients to study in 47XXY, kind of a uniform defect was, we thought, a good way to, to look at those patients. Many of them are undiagnosed during their lifetime, variable phenotypic presentation, uh, certainly as you know very well, metabolic, hormonal, potentially neoplastic uh, risks, especially breast cancer, neurodevelopmental issues, which also often brings them to the Pete's endocrine clinic, and, you know, management potentially with testosterone replacement. But this talk is going to focus more on fertility and potential fertility preservation for these patients.
So, recognized cause of severe testicular defunction. Typically, patients have very small volume testes. Average volume of the testes of the patients we see are 2.5 mLs, where, of course, normal testicular volume should be 15 to 20 mLs. Um, the vast majority of these men are azospermic, although a few rare men will have very severe oligospermia with less than a million sperm per cc. There is a concept that germ cells are lost during puberty, although, again, the data behind this is extremely limited. It's basically a handful of patients who have had biopsies during their teen years and doing that comparison rather than having true data of what happens as boys go through 12, 13, 14, or you know, through their uh, spermarchy um, steps. Sperm retrieval with ICSI is effective to allow fertility for adult male patients. We first reported this in New England Journal of Medicine back in 1998, based on a couple of uh, couples that we had treated. But there is very variable both sperm retrieval rates as well as variable success in treatment at a wide variety of centers around the world. And even though we look at these patients as actually being fairly favorable now in terms of their prognosis for treatment, some people would say that based on their markedly elevated FSH and small volume testes, they are poor candidates for treatment. I'll go through all of our data for that. So. This is just two slides pulled out of an article published in 2011 that basically goes through a series of kind of examples of what testis biopsies may look at, at um, in children at nine, nine and a half years of age, 19 years of age, and adults. And you can see on the right side, which is the column uh, with the fine filters, even though you appear to have reasonable number of germ cells in children, those germ cells appear to be lost as you go through a pubertal transition. And so one of the potential concepts we thought about in fertility preservation is perhaps this germ cell loss, which may occur early in spermatogenesis, there are rodent models for that. Perhaps that's something that we could capitalize on from a clinical standpoint and try to get sperm from these patients early. We'll talk about that further. So when we think about azospermia, we you can categorize this in a couple of different ways, low semen volume, normal semen volume azospermia, where the low semen volume are often congenital absence of the vas, although obviously the differential is very broad. Or you can also characterize them and that's the way we typically do in treatment, as obstructive and non-obstructive. So obviously, those with non-obstructive azospermia tend to have smaller testes, higher FSH, and so they usually can be clinically characterized. We don't have to do a biopsy to document the level of production in the vast majority of cases, and actually testis biopsy is almost stopped as a diagnostic tool that we use use it as a treatment tool in part, but as a diagnostic tool, not much value. So for these patients, if they're obstructed, we certainly can consider microsurgical reconstruction. But for the vast majority of these patients, they're often treated with sperm retrieval and ICSI. Now, the treatment of obstructed patients with sperm retrieval and ICSI is fairly trivial. That was a challenge when we first started to do it, but again, now it's relatively straightforward. There are some little quirks. If you're treating an obstructed man, we, we know that the epididymis is supposed to allow sperm maturation through the epididymis. And so classically, we think of the distal parts of the epididymis as having the more functional sperm. In an obstructed system, whether it's congenital absence of the vas or post-vasectomy, is actually a sort of reverse. The epididymis in these obstructed patients is acting both as a maturation site for sperm, but also as a removal site. So if you look at the distal epididymis, you'll often see 
no sperm, sperm fragments, or dead and dying sperm. Typically with a large number of macrophages that are invading into the epididymal lumen and removing them. So from a technical standpoint, we actually see the best sperm quality, often closer to the testicle. And again, that's a complete reversal of what we expect in normal physiology. And you know, occasionally we will see patients where they were explored, no sperm could be found. We have pretty strong evidence that they're obstructed with normal production. We go back and you just need to look at a different area of the epididymis. I came to New York to work with Wayne Barton, whose who's former wife, Dorothy Krieger, is actually a you know, major endocrinologist here, a huge figure in the field. Wayne taught me a lot. One of the things he taught me is about how segmented the epididymis is in terms of its function. That was cute and interesting in terms of looking at gene expression in the lab, but functionally, we use that every day when we treat these obstructive patients. Because treatment of obstructive patients is pretty straightforward at this point, I'm not going to discuss that further. We're going to talk about the men with testicular failure, not obstructive vasospermia, so severely impaired sperm production. So, non obstructive vasospermia by definition is sperm production so impaired that no sperm appear in the ejaculate. Again, classically, patients have small testicular volume markedly elevated FSH. If you look at obstructed patients, and, and you know certainly your assays may say a normal range for FSH is 1 to 16, remember that the reference population for that is often a group of older men, not young, healthy men who are appearing for infertility. So if it, FSH is over 7.6 or 8, that really is an abnormal FSH for a young man. FSH, in my mind, um, is usually, not always, but usually a reflection of the amount of Sertoli cell germ cell interaction that is occurring within the testicle. So conceptually, in my mind, if I see a man with markedly elevated FSH, I know that he has very few germ cells within the testicle. And, you know, that's just a marker for what's going on internally. And that's part of my mindset. As I'll show later, these patients who have, because of lack of germ cells, predominant Sertoli cell only pattern, those patients are actually somewhat easier to treat than some of the maturation arrest patients. We certainly see patients with non obstructive vasospermia who have maturation arrest. Again, because they have a large number of germ cells within the testis, because the testis is large, they'll often look potentially like obstructive patients, normal volume, normal FSH. <coughs> Again, remember, they have normal FSH because of those large number of germ cells. It doesn't mean they're maturing to fully form sperm. You also rarely will see some patients who have normal volume testes and Sertoli cell only with a relatively normal testis volume and FSH. Again, that large mass of Sertoli cells is providing enough to the pituitary to drive down FSH. That's a rarity, but of course, like everything in medicine, you'll see some exceptions. So when we started looking at whether we could treat men with non-obstructive azospermia, we were very interested in kind of getting a defined class of those men. And we were just identifying Y chromosome microdeletions as a relatively common, about 7% of men with non-obstructive azospermia. And so we very quickly developed a genetics lab. Why? So we could do clinical testing, but more importantly, get the DNA from those men so we could characterize them further. And now we've got a bank of almost 4,000 DNA samples from men with severely impaired spermatogenesis, again, because we're using that as a clinical test. But the AZF or Y chromosome microdeletions were not very well characterized at that point. When we looked at a model of impaired sperm production, we used Klinefelters. We figured those patients were at least easier to characterize together, so we focused on them. 
their testicular phenotype was relatively consistent. They tended to have a lot of sclerotic tubules within the testicle. They tended to have um, Leydig cell hyperplasia on a testis biopsy, working together with Matt Hardy, who is a brilliant uh, PhD expert in Leydig cells. We actually counted Leydig cells within the Kleinfelter testis, compared it to normal testes. We actually found, although there's a lot of overlap, <coughs> we found that the total number of Leydig cells per testis was actually fairly similar whether you had testicular failure or you were normal. And again, that was a very interesting observation. We have some theories about how these clumps of Leydig cells are actually not very efficient at releasing testosterone into the circulation because Leydig cells have a lot of aromatase activity that may actually predispose that testosterone conversion to estrogens. And again, that concept, which we certainly see in Leydig cell tumors, gave us at least a hormonal uh, potential pattern for how we could look at these patients. And again, our goal in looking at Kleinfelter patients and trying to treat them was, we knew they had abnormal testosterone, abnormal testosterone estradiol ratios. We could treat that, perhaps we could abrogate some of the anti-fertility effects in those testes. So we started looking at medical therapy to improve sperm production prior to um, surgical sperm retrieval. We knew that testosterone is commonly used in Kleinfelter patients, particularly for neurobehavioral features, as well as to um, induce puberty for those men who have overall severely impaired testosterone production. But we actually found that that exogenous testosterone, not surprisingly, may suppress sperm production. Certainly, testosterone has been used as a contraceptive agent. And if you suppress your gonadotropins enough, you're going to suppress sperm production. So we're concerned about that, and we certainly saw that. Men with Kleinfelters who had received testosterone previously had much lower 25% sperm retrieval rates versus those men who didn't have testosterone that was given exogenously before, about 65-70%. So we looked at all of these patients together, and um, we knew in the past they had a poor prognosis for sperm retrieval, where we're looking to see how we could improve that. So there was also more information that was coming out about Kleinfelters and what's really going on within the testis. And one of the theories that occurred early on is Kleinfelter patients will only have sperm production if they have 46 XY spermatogonia. As we started to look at sperm and analyze them further, we actually started to see that um, there is an increased prevalence of hyperhaploid sperm. In other words, sperm with an extra X chromosome within the testis. Since there's no hypohaploidy, meaning you don't see sperm that are missing X chromosomes, this is not just a removal of an X chromosome. It is direct evidence that 47 XXY spermatogonia must be able to make sperm. Now, in theory, if you have a 47 XXY spermatogonium and it is making sperm, you're going to have 50% euploid sperm and 50% hyperhaploid sperm, sperm with an extra X chromosome. In practice, we see that's closer to 10 or 15%. We also see as you move down the reproductive pathway, whether you're looking at embryos, or you're looking at live births, you have further selection against that extra X chromosome. So it starts at the sperm production level, it continues at the embryo level, and it, uh, if you look at ongoing pregnancies, it's even lower. So it goes 10%, 5%, less than 1%. That was reassuring to us <coughs> because um, obviously we didn't want to have children with extra X chromosomes and technically doing biopsies on these embryos can be challenging. But <clears throat> it also gave us direct suggestion that at least some of the sperm are being produced by 47 XXY spermatogonium. 
We then focus further on this low serum testosterone, which of course low testosterone can be low production, or it can be excess aromatization of testosterone to estradiol. So we looked at that by measuring testosterone to estradiol ratios. We knew that testosterone to estradiol conversion certainly occurs in men as they age, but it also occurs in the Kleinfelter patients and to some degree in other men with severely impaired sperm production. So we looked at a series of these patients. We tried to define what would be a normal testosterone to estradiol ratio. And we basically came to a cut point of about 10. That's a cut point of 10 if you're looking at testosterone in nanograms per deciliter and estradiol in micrograms per ml, sort of the standard um, numbers that we use for evaluating testosterone and estradiol in the United States. Obviously, you've got to adjust that international for international units. But TE ratio less than 10 was considered abnormal because it's what we see in testicular failure patients, but not in normal men. We then said, can you treat these patients medically? When we started the treatment, testolactone was really the only aromatase inhibitor immediately available. And fortunately, that worked pretty well. It was interesting because we were using a dose that was much lower than um, Dick Clark and Richard Sharon's had previously used. And interestingly, testolactone actually impairs testosterone production. I think it acts on, um, basically decreases your 17-hydroxyprogesterone levels directly. So there's an anti-testosterone production effect as well as aromatase inhibition from a testolactone. When we used an astrazole, we found that was a relatively effective uh, inhibitor uh, of aromatase. But we also recognize some degree of tachyphylaxis. And actually, Longcope and others who have used this in adult men have observed the same thing. So you get an action that lasts for a couple of months, but then you lose the effectiveness of that aromatase inhibition. And that tailors how long we use these drugs uh, to some degree. Clomiphene um, had more limited data. Conceptually, would be limited because we knew a lot of the patients are hypergonadotropic to start with. And if you already have high LH levels, driving them higher with clomiphene conceptually doesn't make a lot of sense. Although functionally, we find a number of patients who respond to clomiphene. We basically, uh, we also saw that HCG and anastrozole uh, work together. And actually it's probably the best combination for empiric treatment of Kleinfelter patients with a low testosterone level. Why is that true when they already have relatively elevated LH levels? Is not clear. We often find with anastrozole monotherapy that they don't respond as well as with HCG and anastrozole. But that's just a clinical observation. So, lytic cells are the primary testicular source of aromatase. It is <coughs> Clear if we look at men who are endogenously product, producing testosterone versus those on testosterone replacement. And fortunately, a lot of the Kleinfelter patients, you know, we've been able to observe them endogenously producing testosterone, then giving them exogenous testosterone. If your aromatase is coming from liver or fat, you would expect the TB ratios to be the same in both of those settings. We actually see the TB ratios are abnormal when Kleinfelter patients are producing testosterone within the testicle and they normalize when it's being given exogenously. So that gave us strong, uh, at least observational evidence that the source of aromatase activity for these men is actually the testicle itself. <clears throat> now again, even though you supposedly increase aromatase with HCG administration, it is quite possible that the physical arrangement of the lytic cells, similar to what we see in lytic cell tumors, is actually what's driving that testosterone to estradiol conversion, the increased TB ratios we see in these patients. You have to be careful about aromatase inhibition. If you drive estradiol levels too low, you'll lose the physiologic effect, which is basically um, what happens, estradiol acts on the efferent ducts and allows reabsorption of fluid, 
and um, you give a rodent and aromatase inhibitor because of their large volume of testosterone production and the inhibition of fluid production, the testicle blows up and it ends up becoming atrophic because of uh, compromise with the excess pressure within the testicle. Sure. So I actually have a patient who was put on it's a non so it just last week was put on ACG neurotase, testicle blew up, and this patient is now concerned that uh, this is permanent. Is this permanent? Or by wearing a jock strap and wearing off every day to make it recover? Of course, it may be unrelated, but there's certainly concern if you have too much pressure in the testicle, just like with testicular torsion, which is really a venous event, creating increased pressure in the testicle, then a loss of arterial inflow, <coughs> that you can damage the testicle in that setting. So that's part of the reason we've stayed away from more potent um, aromatase inhibitors like letrozole, um, exavestane, et cetera. Also because if you drive estradiol levels down too low, you lose libido for men. So that you know, estrogen has some interaction. Of course, as we look at adolescence, we're concerned about uh, excess aromatase and, and adversely affecting um, estradiol and bone development. So we were able to see a response to aromatase inhibitors in some of these patients. And we could do that without knocking estradiol levels down to pathologic levels. So this is just um, in our original trials when we're using testolactone. These are patients who had sperm in the ejaculate to begin with. We looked at total modal sperm count, patients pre-testolactone, on testolactone, and compared them to a series of control patients that did not go on to treatment. So we saw an increase in total modal sperm count associated with that testolactone treatment. When we extended that further to patients who were treated with anastrozole, the results were not quite as dramatic, but for oligospermic men, we did overall see sperm concentration increases and total modal sperm count increases, although the motility changes and morphology changes were not statistically significant. <coughs> These are not randomized control trials. These are just interventional trials and observational. Similarly, when we looked alone at patients uh, with Kleinfelters who received, this is not testosterone therapy, this is a therapy to enhance endogenous testosterone production. So it's an amalgam of patients treated with anastrozole, HCG and anastrozole, and clomiphene. Although the baseline testosterone level, which obviously around 150 nanograms per deciliter is very low, with treatment, those patients who responded best, who had the highest testosterone levels, had a higher chance of sperm retrieval. So there's two potential, many explanations possibly for this, but at least two potential explanations. One is that that medical therapy is actually driving better sperm production. That's why we're succeeding. The second, which may be equally plausible, is that those patients with better uh, testes and some sperm production were also those more likely to respond to medical therapy. Unfortunately, we're now sort of stuck with a conundrum of patients who read all of those data and believe that they have to be treated with medications before sperm retrieval, even though we don't have strong certainly not level one evidence to suggest that that medical therapy really makes a difference. It certainly conceptually does. So how do we approach the male infertility patients overall who are candidates for sperm retrieval for non-obstructive azospermia? So a lot of them have low testosterone after ruling out any um, primary causes, pituitary abnormality. We will treat the patients who have a low T and low TE ratios with an astrozole. We'll treat them with a CIRM if their testosterone to estradiol ratio is greater than 10 or normal. The Kleinfelter patients, as I said, often respond best to HCG and an astrozole. Because of that tactical axis, we usually only treat for two months. Testosterone acts more dominantly on the later stages of spermatogenesis, so conceptually that does make sense with the spermatogenic cycle. <coughs> 
and we'll follow their GE ratios, obviously, on therapy. We always do a semen analysis on the day of the planned sperm retrieval because there's a lot of patients labeled as being azospermic with very rare sperm in the ejaculate. So, we know that men with non-obstructive azospermia have abnormal production. Fortunately, many of those men have heterogeneity of sperm production, <coughs> meaning even though the overall production is poor, inadequate production for sperm to reach the ejaculate, there are hundreds of seminiferous tubules within the testicle. These are all separately functioning units. They are structurally separated from each other by at least a thin septum, and their, epithel their seminiferous epithelium does not connect with another tubule. It goes into the reedy testis with a different transitional epithelium. So if you have sperm production in one tubule of the testicle, it doesn't translate to another tubule. And that's a good model for thinking about recovery of spermatogenesis, for example, after chemotherapy, particularly alkylating agent chemotherapy, where you may knock out stem cells in a large number of the tubules of the testicle, but you can have focal recovery of that spermatogenesis. Um, first time I went in to do sperm retrieval on a patient who was rendered azospermic by chemotherapy, I said, you gotta be stupid to do this, get chemotherapy. Chemotherapy obviously acted in all areas of the testicle. Why would you think one area will work and another doesn't? Well, it turns out, regardless of the cause of decreased sperm production, whether it's an AZFC deletion of the Y chromosome, Klinefelter's, or chemotherapy, you'll often have more effect on one tubule than another. So if you have a single tubule left with stem cells in it, those stem cells will repopulate that tubule. The tubule actually grows and has sperm within it, but every other area of the testicle may not have sperm. So concept that heterogeneity is present is critical to our success in treating these patients, and all we need to do is find one spot with sperm. This is just an overview, and it's a mixed um, overview in terms of both etiology and sort of phenotypic description of the patients with non-obstructive azospermia. So in the top right, I've referred to a lot of them as idiopathic. Turns out probably Oh, about 60, 65% of the patients are idiopathic, and that's actually the major focus of our research efforts to try to understand why those patients are, are azospermic. Um, and again, there's probably a wide variety of genetic defects that contributes, particularly in the maturation arrest patients. In the yellow part of the pie, we basically have labeled them as Sertoli cell only. Obviously, we don't know why they're Sertoli cell only, but that's how we characterize them. 16% of the patients with cryptorchidism, 10% with Klinefelter's, Y microdeletions, again, about 7% post chemotherapy um, are other patients as well. So, when we evaluate these patients, we'll do both a karyotype as well as a Y chromosome microdeletion analysis, not just for knowledge of why they have impaired sperm production, but also for prognosis. If we look at the patients who have a complete deletion of AZFA, world literature suggests none of those patients have germ cells and none have had sperm. Less rare is AZFB or B plus C deletion, and those patients will often have germ cells, but there are no well-documented cases, and we have no cases where we've been able to get sperm that are functional to use either in the ejaculate or from the testicle. But if I see a patient who's coming in, I know nothing but they have an AZFC deletion, that is actually a good prognosis. So AZFA is awful, AZFB is bad, AZFC is pretty cool, because most of them are treatable. It tends to be on multiple choice tests what for your all. Uh, azospermic factor of the Y chromosome. It, it's the area referred to as the uh, long arm of the Y chromosome that have these regions. So it's a PCR-based test we use for that. And again, for ACFC-deleted patients, you'll often have very rare sperm in the ejaculate. They may need, not even need surgery. For those who are truly azospermic, we find sperm about 70% of the time. So net-net, the proportion of patients we can't treat with ACFC deletions is small. <clears throat> 
So, typical um, view of a patient seen through an operating microscope, normal length of the human testis is four to five centimeters. This is a 1.5 centimeter testis. Um, and you'll actually, I think, see later how you can dissect within this testis to actually identify sites of sperm production. Very abnormal testes in these men that we're treating. We initially started off just by doing biopsies. And we do a biopsy of the testicle. And then if we didn't see sperm, the lab team would be there. and They'd look at that. We do another biopsy. Then we do another biopsy. And we continue this. And not only was this tedious, but we became concerned that you could actually damage since a lot of the blood supply of the testis runs just underneath the capsule or, or tunic albuginia. We became concerned about it. And sure enough, we saw a patient who had had 20 biopsies by another <coughs> surgeon where that testis became atrophic and devascularized from the multiple biopsies. So just doing biopsies alone didn't seem to be the right approach. And again, based on that patient we had seen with devascularization, we were concerned. We also subsequently learned that when sperm production is present, it tends to be present throughout an entire seminiferous tubule. So if you identify the right tubule, you're in good shape. My filter patients are interesting because they'll often have a segment of the tubule with sperm production and then sclerosis on the two pittance of that. So you need to look a little more carefully through the Kleinfelter patient's testis to identify those small spots that can be as small as um, one or two millimeters in size. We're also concerned about the blood supply of the testicle, and we use some of John Jarrow's old work to, to try and think about how we could get into the testicle, look at the tissue, and um, not damage the testicle in the process. And based on these images, we basically decided to use an equatorial incision in the testicle and actually taking that large blood vessel doesn't devascularize the testis, it tends to have multiple sources. But if you do 20 biopsies, you can knock off a number of these sites and that can result in damage to the testicle. So we had a way to get into the testicle. We used an operating microscope to try to do that. And then within the testicle, we recognize that these seminiferous tubules were highly coiled, but they tend to go from the central part of the testicle out to the periphery and back again, and they had vessels that ran parallel to them. So if you follow that anatomy and you stay parallel to the vessels, you could go deep within the testicular tissue without disrupting the blood supply to the testicle. And as I started to use the operating microscope to more safely get into the testicle, we observed that some tubules were larger or different from others, at which point it became obvious that those tubules that are larger must have more germ cells. The larger tubules are the ones that are clearly more likely to have sperm than the small sclerotic tubules. And sure enough, that turned out to be true. We did a very limited study of random biopsies versus the micro or microsurgically searching through the, the tissue and found we did about 40% better with directed biopsies, even in our early experience, than um, uh, less directed biopsies. So this sort of reflects what the procedure looks like now. Um, testicle can be opened widely in an equatorial plane, and that the testicle will survive that without any vascular insult. You can then dissect in these parallel lines of the seminiferous tubules maintaining the blood supply to the testicle. We used to think of the testicle as just sort of a mass of tissue that fell apart. It turns out that it has pretty distinct structure. And again, you can follow that closely. Um, there are studies that have also looked at using needles to go into and map out where sperm production is a testicle versus TESI as a conventional procedure, which is multiple biopsies and looking at all of the comparative studies together in a meta-analysis. Conventional TESI is about twofold better than using line needle aspiration to identify sites of sperm production. And micro TESI is again about one and a half fold better than conventional TESI in terms of finding sperm. So that's why we use it. This is just the background 
of that study looking at microtessy versus conventional biopsies versus uh, finding the aspiration. So one of the key things we also identified is many men will have several semen analyses where the centrifuge pellet is not looked at very closely. Typically in a semen analysis, you may start off with three to five mLs of fluid. It'll be concentrated down to a couple of hundred microliters. That pellet is then examined by looking at five or 10 or maybe 20 microliters of the fluid, not the entire 300 or 400 microliters. So if you do an extended search, there'll be patients where you find sperm where you miss them otherwise. So we will often go ahead and we'll always get a semen sample on the day of planned surgery for sperm retrieval. And about five or 10% of the time we see enough sperm despite multiple reports of azospermia before, we don't even need to do the surgery. We also have found that you know, for those guys who have very rare sperm, they can actually produce several samples in one day. Since the epididymis has kind of a six to 10 day supply of sperm, you're basically emptying the epididymis by doing that and still get sperm in several samples. And when you're you know, looking at 10 or 15 eggs and you have very, very limited numbers of sperm, having extra samples is technically uh, a good trick to help uh, the lab to get enough sperm. So this is sort of what it looks like to open up uh, the tissue. Uh, you can actually see a little bit of scar right here. This patient actually had fine needle aspiration previously in the testicle. One of the reasons we don't like fine needle aspiration is you always get some bleeding and some scar as a consequence of that. Schematically, um, this is basically what we do. Schematically, we are opening in the equatorial plane of the testicle, and that basically goes into a natural anatomic plane between seminiferous tubules. Um, there is some manipulation that is required of that tissue. It's relatively floppy tissue. So you've got to, for example, push up on the back of the testicle to allow enough tension to be able to dissect along these tubules. Looked at higher power, you can see the configuration of the tubules parallel to some of those vessels. What we dissect between those tubules, looking for an area of larger tubules, and then pull that out, disperse it, and allow the lab to look at it, and that's how we get sperm. Looked at in real time, uh, basically, again, open up the testicle. The dissection itself is done with um, bipolar forceps, so we very carefully control any bleeding. We believe that risk to the testicle is mostly bleeding that you leave behind and create scar. And so there can be lower testosterone levels. It's just one dissection that is done parallel to those vessels. And eventually you will find that there is a very small area uh, of sperm production we are able to find after dissecting through these tissues. Um, all of these tissues that are being dissected here are being maintained. They're still vital and they will heal, come together. But again, your risks are related to the bleeding you leave behind. It's subtle in this view but actually there is a visibly uh, visible difference in the seminar for tubules we're plucking out of the little corner there and uh, get bipolar powdery from a lot of this. We try to avoid that area right next to the tunic albuginia because it has such rich blood vessels, but all we need is that little bit of tissue So we've done sperm retrieval in over 2,600 men uh, to date. We do this together with an IVF cycle for the woman. That carries a risk that we won't have sperm. <coughs> the rare sperm that we get often don't survive freezing and thawing. Sperm retrieval often is the day before the wife's egg retrieval, last time for processing, and uh, that way we can use fresh, non-frozen sperm for injection. Overall, 54% sperm retrieval rate for a first-time attempt. Patients who have had failed biopsies before have a lower retrieval rate. 
but for first time attempts, it's 54%. Normally with ICSI, you'll get about a 70%, 75% fertilization rate. These testicular sperm overall fertilize at a 45% rate. So there's some numbers in terms of having enough eggs to infect so that you have enough embryos so that you have enough to transfer. Once we see sperm in the operating room, chance that there will be a pregnancy six weeks later with a fetal heartbeat on ultrasound is 46%. So again, sperm retrieval the day before allows acquisition of motility and time for processing. And basically, once we see sperm, the lab tells us we can stop dissection. If we don't see sperm in the operating room, the lab will go ahead and process that tissue. But unfortunately, if we don't see sperm in the operating room, it's hard to find sperm in the lab that occurs only a couple of percent of the time. Um, and again, I've talked a little bit about how we use uh, fresh sperm. So interestingly, sperm retrieval is dependent on having an advanced region of sperm development, and that's not reflected by the way we usually measure overall testicular function. It's not affected by FSH. It's not affected by the volume of the testicle. So if we look um, in this bar graph at FSH levels along the x-axis, you'll see that actually sperm retrieval rates are maintained even when you get FSHs of 30, 40, 50, 70, 100, 120. So that reflects the overall testicle, but not the single best area of the testicle, which is what our, success rate, our sperm retrieval success rate is based on. Uh, where do we find the sperm? Well, we'll initially find it. When we first open the testicle about 60% of the time, we're going to go deep within the testicle about 30% of the time. We're going to go to the other testicle about 10% of the time. Unfortunately, these the data that we have prior to sperm retrieval is difficult to use to predict sperm retrieval. And this is just an example for a set of men with you know, larger volume testes greater than 15 cc's. If you look at the sperm retrieval rates for three different subsets of men, you actually see that it's a non-linear relationship between that FSH and the sperm retrieval chance. So it is difficult prognostically to figure out who has sperm and who doesn't prior to surgery. Even when biopsies were done before and didn't see any sperm, even when three or four biopsies were done for testis and didn't see sperm, we can still see sperm about 20% of the time with this more detailed search through the tissue. Um, this is more related to kind of the IVF processing and also the issues with limited numbers of embryos. <clears throat> Many IVF centers will take embryos out to five days, plasticist stage, biopsy them, freeze them, and transfer them subsequently. Often we have so few embryos in these patients, we're transferring them on day three, so we don't run the risk that they're lost in the process of trying to go to five days or freezing and thawing oocytes, excuse me, embryos. And again, you need a good number of eggs for this to work. So in Kleinfelter syndrome, particularly sperm is a limited resource. Up to 70% of men have sperm in the testis, despite the lack of sperm in the ejaculate. We do get low fertilization rates, limited number of embryos, so we often transfer, again, earlier than day five. Um, in theory, up to 50% of those sperm should be hyperhaploid, but we only see it for 10% of sperm, 5% of the embryos, and less than 1% of ongoing <coughs> pregnancies. So we don't routinely do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is, again, usually done on that day five stage. For the adolescent, this is a little more challenging. Early on, we were concerned about these biopsy studies that suggested sperm production was going to progressively decrease as they went through early spermarchy and early puberty. So we will often ask those young men when we see them for a semen sample, see if we can get sperm to freeze. We've tried a wide variety of different approaches to treat those patients during adolescence and try to retrieve sperm for freezing. We've actually backed off on that now. So for the um, adolescent Kleinfelter, they don't have sperm within the testis, and they're not going to receive testosterone replacement or exogenous testosterone therapy 
will allow them to progress and then go ahead and treat them with sperm retrieval and IVF when they're actually married because it puts those components together. For the young men who require testosterone replacement, we will go into one testicle, try and retrieve sperm early and freeze them for later use. But again, the pendulum has sort of swung back in terms of our surgical intervention because I was not convinced we were helping these kids by operating on them early. Um, that's just an overview of that as well. So, Feinfelter syndrome is about 10% of our non-obstructive azospermic cases. Uh, sperm retrieval in adults is common despite that azospermia. It requires surgery in most cases. It requires IVF. Management of these couples together is complex. For the Kleinfelter adolescent patients, assess semen analysis as soon as we see them in early adolescence. And as testosterone therapy is planned, then we'll do upfront testicular sperm retrieval and freezing. Um, but we prefer whenever possible, if they go through puberty, they have adequate androgen production internally just to follow them along and then go from there. So that's sort of the pathway that we've taken and a lot of the steps we've done in the management of severe male infertility. Also, like Kleinfelter's is a great example of that for us and how we use that to sort of guide some of the treatment we use for other patients. And Alice, again, thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Maybe one question because there's a regular conference that comes in this room. Well, I'm not, does anybody want to burn the rest? Okay. Was that a question? Out of the floor of the house. I just asked him to ask 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 him so for the congenital absence of the vast patients with advanced screening, you can find CF mutations 85 to 90 percent. The other 10 percent or so often will have renal malformations. So we'll do ultrasounds on them because, again, that could be a mesonephric defect or what's far more common is a defect in CF production that is subtle enough that the Wolfian duct doesn't fully develop. So they have a touch of an epididymis, and that's about it. Is that an exaggeration of what happens in adolescence? The vanishing testis usually refers to um, prepartum or um, basically torsion of the testicle that occurs prior to birth. So that's thought to be the more common cause of that. You know, anybody who measures intertesticular testosterone test results in this patient? In rodent models, they actually have high intratesticular testosterone levels. We believe they're going to have high T to E ratios. And again, if you think about normal testicle, there's one or two lytic cells right next to a capillary. Testosterone goes right out. Kleinfelter testis, just because of limited number of tubules, has clumps of lytic cells. So the testosterone from that lytic cell has to go by all of these other aromatase-rich lytic cells. And therefore, you get a lot of testosterone, but you also get a lot of TDE conversion, similar to a lytic cell tumor. I have to make one mention of my mentor, my prior mentor, Dr. J. Lester Gabriel, for whom our division is named. So I, during my fellowship, I worked with him. And uh, we were writing up a paper on the vanishing testes syndrome. He, he had some um, testicular vein analysis of, uh, of various steroid hormones with Harold Mitty that they had done. And we never, I still got, I still have the data, I guess I could re resurrect it. But his, his hypothesis was that it wasn't a vanishing testes, that it was a, a dysfunctional testes, that, that they never really had good testicular function, um, and that there was a little nubbin of some testicular tissue 
there. And it wasn't that they had it and it vanished. It was that it had never, never really fully developed. But also, along those lines, you're saying that aromatase is from the lytic cells. I thought aromatase all these years was from the Sertoli cells as well as inhibitor. And so I'm curious about that. How do you know it's lytic cells and not Sertoli cells? It can be Sertoli cells. Um, there's really no conformational change in the Sertoli cell that would explain that. If you look at lytic cell tumors, they tend to have sort of more feminization, more excess estradiol production than Sertoli cell tumors do. But Sertoli cell tumors are also more rare. So that, that awesome. yeah, both looking at cell culture as well as looking at kind of human models, that's where we put that together. And just the relevant field of the client of the cells who is not interested in facility. Anything beyond this to start from a person? We've certainly used for symptomatic low testosterone adults, we've used aromatase inhibitors, we've used HCG in aromatase. They usually tire of the injections over time. And you know, even though you get a increase in testosterone, it's often not enough to be symptomatically helpful. For those patients, but it's an option. There is one thing that you need to do, which is uh, diabetes screening and I didn't go through the whole spectrum of disease. Sorry, Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Well, we'll have to have you back. I don't know why we haven't had you here before. If it, it was, and I'm glad that that you were able to come today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rick.